Center with Loyalist Township's Heritage, Culture and Tourism Division. Um, today's presentation will be recorded and available to watch from the Township's website. Um, and we do ask if you have questions, just to add them in the chat. You're welcome to um, unmute yourself when we do have a question time, but um, that just helps us keep the presentation going. Um, so between 1869 and 1932, over 100,000 children were sent from Britain to Canada through assisted juvenile emigration. These migrants are called home children as they were sent from the British emigration agencies and were placed in families in rural Canada. Descendants and genealogists continue to try to connect the missing pieces to share the stories of these children. Today, volunteer and BHC descendant Shannon McKnight will be hosting the Zoom talk, um, sharing a story of British home children in Ontario and the personal genealogical quest that she has been on. Shannon is a lifelong lover of history and nature. She became interested in family history with her father when they discovered that her great grandmother was a British home child and became obsessed with finding out about her story. Shannon loves learning about things from her past and how we can teach it others about our ancestors, the lives they lived, and the things that they encountered. Um, Shannon comes from a line of storytellers, farmers, fighters, and fighters for equality, and we're very grateful that she was able to join us this morning to share her story. So I am going to um, mute myself and turn off my video. Um, Shannon's going to share her screen, and I'll be around if anybody has any questions. I must apologize, everybody. I'm having some technical difficulties. It's my, unfortunately the trend this morning. I'm just figuring out how to share my screen right now. Sorry. Oh, Do I still this worked last night? All right, so I think I finally figured it out. All right. So thank you for inviting me. Welcome, everybody. Sorry for the little bit delay. I'm here to share the stories and history of the home children in Canada. My name is Shannon McKnight, and I am a long line, lifelong history and nature lover. I, along with my dad, are the family historians. I'm a descendant of Lily Millen, a home child. What happened in England between 1937 and, sorry guys, this is all my bad, 1901. It's a brief history of it. So, and uh, does anybody have any questions about what was happening in this time? Well, Queen Victoria reigned from 1837 to 1901. There was an industrial revolution with factories and sweatshops. More people moved from the countryside to the cities to work in factories. Homes as population increased, but the living and working conditions did not. There was no social services beyond what your parish church could provide. If a parent died due to sickness or injury and with no income, there was only the streets to quote, live in. There was no health care with no indoor plumbing. The streets were cesspools of waste, human and animal. Families flocked to the cities that had rooms to rent. Sometimes a family lived in two rooms with up to six to 12 people living there. 
children were expected to work to help provide for their families. There was a lot of deaths from infants, children, parents. As the cities were cesspool of germs and waste, there was no bathrooms, plumbing, running water as waste was often emptied into the streets as was the norm of the time. From the brief book, uh, from the book, A Brief History of Life in Victorian Britain, A Social History of Queen Victoria's Reign by Michael Patterson. Science was solving medical problems, making childbirth easier, infant mortality lower, life expectancy longer. The temperance movement was combating the scourge of drunkenness. People like Sir Walter Besant, author and philanthropist, were successfully awakening the public conscious to social evils. Education was becoming universal and providing opportunities for self-improvement and a great deal of practical help. Most of the results of private charity and enterprise was rather, rather than government, governmental intervention was given to the unfortunate for this was the age of Dr. Bernardo and of William Booth's Salvation Army. So this is the home children uh, information. What was happening in Canada from 1880 to 1939? A lot of things were happening. There was expansion to the West. There was immigration from China and Europe. It was the First World War, 1914 to 1918. Depression in the 1920s. And the Second World War in 1943 to 47. But there was also people needed to move. England was overcrowded. And uh, there was reasons for England needed to put people, but the little, the unwanted. So they brought them over. So people could have helpers. There was domestics. The people wanting to um, give them a new life, but there was always a catch. So there's over 4 million descendants in Canada, and yet silence. Most Canadians do not know their story. From the late 19th century to 1948, over 100,000 lonely and frightened children, all of ages, were brought to Canada in migrant schemes, which today are called barbaric and dreadful. By Bernardo's, the main organization responsible, believed by Canadians to be orphans, but only 12% truly were. The children brought to Canada to be used as indentured servants for our farms and households. Although not new to England, this particular migration wave was born of great change in Britain, an age of poverty and overcrowding with no welfare system. Thousands of abandoned children lived and died in British streets. Woefully inadequate institutions were swamped and immigration seemed a brilliant solution. Canada was expanding and building new cities and were part of the Commonwealth and it was seemed to be an, an easy solution. In 1869, a ma mass wave of structured immigration of children from the United Kingdom to Canada was started. Throughout the years, over, over 10,000, 100,000 children were brought to our shores. These children, many forever separated from their families, friends, and culture, were here to work as laborers and domestics. They were collectively known as the British home children. There were over 50 sending organizations which sent children across Canada. A lot of the children came from workhouses or the streets of London, on, London, England. With the overcrowding and poor working and living conditions, parents and children were time spent in the homes were better than dying in the streets. Some of the children had only one parent living or their families had fall, fallen in on hard times and it seemed a better choice for them at the time. Some families had planned their children stays in the home as a temporary thing 
to learn a trade and have a roof over their head and food in their belly. The majority, majority of the families could not read or write, so they made their mark on the agreement as someone from the home would read to them. Some of the families decided this was a better opportunity for their child, but others wanted their child stay to be temporary and immigration was not always discussed. So here's a list of some of the uh, sending organizations. Dr. Bernardo's, Maria Rye, Middlemore, Catholic Immigration, also known as Father Hudson, Annie McPherson, Vegans, Quarriers, Salvation Army, Church of England's Waifs and Strays, and Fairbridge, and plus 20 more. Some were much smaller. This immigration of children continued to 1939 into Canada. Children were from toddlers to the age of 18. Fairbridge started to immigrate children in the early 1940s till 1948. Bernardo's, Quarriers, Vegans, Church of English, Waifs and Strays, Annie McPherson's, Maria Rye sent across Canada. A home child was considered low class, a gutter rat to most people, especially in the media. And children were mostly sent in parties, often hundreds at a time. Each were provided with a trunk or a duffel bag to carry their clothing in. And they were woefully inadequate for Canadian winters. Now, there's a, a difference between a home child or a guest child. So from 1869 to, to 1939, when it was officially ended, no intention, a home child was no, had no intention to go home, and it was discouraged to try. Over 100,000 came, and they were here to work. A guest child arrived in June of 1940, to around August of 1940, their intention was to send them home after the war. 1,532 and nine parties came. They were here to be part of a family, not worked. Canada did not want poor children diseased or had genetic defects. These waifs and strays are tainted and corrupt with moral slime and filth, inherited from parents and surroundings of the most foul and disgusting character. And all the washing and clean clothes that Dr. Bernardo may bestow cannot possibly remove. There's no power whatever that can cleanse the lepers so to fit them to become desirable citizens of Canada. And that was in an in a, um, article in Canada. So unfortunately, bad things happen. This is a story of the murder of George Green. George came from Bernardo Holmes and has been, uh, was living in Owen Sound. So uh, in Owen Sound, Ontario, November 15, Miss Henley Finland, Helen, sorry, Finley, an educated and wealthy lady was charged with the murder of George E. Green, a 17 year old boy from the Bernardo home, has been arrested at Big Bay. Neighbors testified that Miss Finley, who's a powerful woman, frequently knocked the lad down and hit him with a heavy stick. She replied that it was always such a chastement as he deserved. This is a the Anthur Mercery Ontario Reformatory for Females. This is her, more or less her arrest report. Helen Finley, sorry, the Pemish and is sometimes quite difficult to read. So I I'll read it out. Helen Finley, age 42, 
This is from the County Gray General Sessions. Date of sentence, June 12th, 1896. The crime was for common assault on eight counts. Served one year for the murder of George Green. This is a dedication statement of the Jordan Green Memorial Stone. My minister, Red Leader. May the stone engraved with the name George Green be forever a symbol of a society pledged to uphold the ever demanding cause of justice, fairness, and opportunity to live in peace, always seeking the well being of every citizen of this beloved country, Canada. He will not be forgotten. There were tens of thousands of children brought to Canada who are at great risk. There was no safeguards put into place to ensure the child reached a particular home. It was literally, you got what you got and you hoped for the best. Most parents were given a notice that the child was removed from the UK, but lots of time no notice or they were given to after the fact so that caused systematic destruction of families most children were forever separated from their parents families siblings country and culture on this after sailing notice the managers will please to furnish you at intervals oh sorry there was a letter that was sorry to Mr. Jones, I am desired to inform you that in accordance with the terms of agreement entered into when Winifred Payne was received for, into this institution, the managers included her in the party of girls who left these homes for Canada. Yesterday is crossed off, this, this month. Should you desire to write the child, her address is the care of the secretary, Dr. Bernardo's home, Hazelbray, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. Your letters will only need a penny stamp if they do not exceed half an ounce in weight. And on the other side, see after sailing notice. The managers were pleased to furnish you at intervals with tidings of our progress and welfare in the new country. I am directed to inform you that in Canada, she'll be under the same kind and watchful supervision on the part of experienced ladies belonging to our home as she would have enjoyed had she remained with us in England. The managers have every reason to believe that our best interests will be served by her immigration. I am yours, faithfully, George. In some incidences, the standardized form called an after sailing notice was sent to the parents or family members of the child after they had been sent to Canada. Often families did not receive any notification of the immigration of their child from the UK. It's not clear why some families received notification while others did not. The thought is, if the parent or parents were considered immoral or bad for the child, the no notification was given. If the child's immigration was not disputed by the family, the notice might be sent. In Winifred's case, she was a true orphan. Both of her parents had died and her siblings were not able to care for her. Not here for love. We're not so young and unsophisticated un as to imagine that the farmers take our boys for love. The primary object of the farmers in taking a boy is that his services be useful to him. Dr. Bernardo, April 1900, and their newsletter, Ups and Downs. In this article, it says, we do not care to speak of our work altogether in terms of profit and loss. We are not employment agents. We are not here to give employers the very best value for their money. But on the other hand, we're not so young and unsophisticated as to imagine that the farmers take our boys for love. There are happily many cases we could point out 
indeed by many hundreds where a very genuine affection and attachment has afterwards sprung up and which boys are looked after and cared for by their employees employers and helped in life as they were, as they could have been by their own parents but the primary object of the farmer is taking a boy is that his services may be useful to him boy about a farm is always handy it's much more the impulse that prompts men to apply for boys than any yearning desire to provide a home for the homeless they needed a worker they needed someone to help with their farm They were brought here to become indentured servants. So this is a um, agreement for Cecil Bennett. This is con for his contract from September 1907 until 19 April 1913. He earned $120 minus expenses, clothing, haircuts, and was forced to donate a dollar a year to back to the Bernardo's Association. The only way you can get out of it was to leave or not be alive. Or if you were lucky, you were able to uh, change farms or buy yourself out, but most um, boys could not. And they put a law in place to protect us against the children following George Green's death. In 1897, Canada mandated into law an act entitled, an act to regulate the immigration into Ontario of certain classes of children. Canada was concerned that these children were, as they called them in our House of Commons, garbage. The act was put into place to protect us against children who were in intellectually or physically defective or had been convicted of a crime. Bernardo claimed he only sent the best children to Canada. William Courier was so infuriated, he stopped sending children to Canada. He sent them to Australia instead. But England did not stop the immigration of children until 1970. Children were sent to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Australia was still receiving children until 1970. And yet, Many home children went on to make good lives and make great contributions to Canada. Uh, the gentleman on in the green shirt, um, that is our Sir George Birdshaw. He actually just got last year, he uh, received the um, Legion of Honor for his service in World War II. And he just turned 100 years old on September 14th. So we have this park lawn in a monument in a cemetery. Oops. Back one. And it is in Toronto. And this is a, we had a, the monument. Um, was built in 2017. So independent filmmaker of Orphan Born Films in Ottawa, in collaboration with the British Home Children Advocacy and Research Association, is very pleased to announce that after years of painstaking research into the lives of 75 children buried in two unmarked graves in Park Lawn, cemetery in Toronto's West End, a monument will be erected to honor these poor souls. This monument was created from a rough block of granite sourced from Quebec quarry, sandblasted and adorned with a piece of plate steel from a ship, complete with a brass porthole. The 1950s ship, the Miss MS Jadran, is a symbol symbolic of the type of vessel that would have carried these orphans 
to the new home country and ports in Montreal, Quebec City, and Halifax. In early 2016, BHCARA started a crowdsource campaign, a GoFundMe page, which was successful in raising over $16,000 to commission and complete this monument. The monument will pay tribute to the over 100,000 girls and boys who ranged in ages from toddlers through 18 years, who came to Canada from 1869 through 1949 as, as domestic help and farm labor from Britain. The graves of the 75 children buried at Parkland Cemetery is a poignant reminder that although many children thrived in Canada, many did not. Our country is dotted with the graves of lost home children. Sadly, many will never be found. Every child who came in Canada deserves to be recognized, including those who perished. I believe there's a reason why these children were revealed to me, states Laurie Chesky, whose partner, Paul Jackson, accidentally discovered these plots. When I discovered these graves, a purely superintendent's discovery, I knew instantly that though, the, though they're lost voices, the story of the plight of our British home children must come to a light. It was through the media coverage of my fundraising efforts for the monument that I was connected to RJ Huggins, who immediately began production of this film. When the monument fundraising campaign was brought to my attention for the first time, it so moved me and I did something that I told myself I would never do as a filmmaker. I decided then and there to create a film of the story of my father, who was one of those children, and to help tell the stories of the thousands of home children and their descendants. Two years, 15 hours of film and a journey that has taken us to England, Nova Scotia and throughout Ontario to do, document the stories both uplifting and tragic has been a cathartic and humbling journey that is still has some miles to go. I'm very proud to have had a hand in design and production of this monument that would have not been possible without a great team of people associated with it, said RJ Huggins of Orphan Boy Films. So today is British Home Child Day or Home Child Day. So across many different areas, everybody is celebrating. Some there's beacons, some are lighting their city signs, some are having talks like we are. It's a chance to celebrate and honor and recognize all these children. This quilt was created in 2016. Each square represents a home child. Most squares were designed by Loria Chesky and sewn by Joanne Clark and Aurelia. Flag material was used to print the squares and the quilt is touchable. The quilt has traveled all over Ontario and also England, Manitoba and Nova Scotia. It's beautiful. This is a Home Children Canada's mission. We are to strive to establish a permanent organization in Canada that represents a home children across the world, establish a head office in a home child's museum, become a recognized Canadian charity, enable HCC to become sustainable, protecting our legacy, enable us to accept donations and to apply for funding and, and grants, and provide funding for producing documentaries and films. We want our stories to be heard. So there's different websites that um, have different information and that are, are, some of them are very searchable. There's books to learn more about British home children. Um, the Little Immigrants by Kenneth Bagwell, Lena Murdoch, Imagine Orphans, Laboring Children by Joe Park, Uprooted Roy Parker, The Golden Bridge by Marjorie Cole, Laying the Children's Ghost to Rest, New Lives for Old, Bleeding of the Lambs, and The Forgotten Home Child by Jennifer Graham. I personally have read this one, I cried. It was beautifully done.
Now, my personal, my family's home children connection. Why the sunflowers? There are about 70 species of sunflowers from yellow, reds to combination of colors. What flower do you like in your lawn? Is it a sunflower as well? The sunflowers range in height from about 12 inches to over 10 feet tall, with the record being about 30 feet tall. The flowers range from single flowers to plants with a dozen blooms on each plant. So this is my home children. This is my nanny. She started life as Agnes Sullivan, continued life towards her mid of her life as Lillian Maitland. I'll tell her a little, tell you a little bit more of her story in a moment. This is uh, Lily Crockford. It's her intake picture from Bernardo's. Some places did take, have intake photos and had them in their files. Some organizations did not take any photos. This is one of the uh, village homes that um, was from Barkingside, Ilford. That's where the lovely lady we just saw, Lily Crawford, had stayed. The little cottage is there. For the, they were the Bernardo's girls village home. They had a house mother and they had, I'm not sure how many children they had in each home. Now, my Lillian, my nanny, she was born Agnes Daisy Sullivan, but she didn't know that at the time because she was in a, sent to an orphanage at age three. So she never knew her family, but when she came to Canada, she was called Lillian, settled in the Ottawa area after she arrived with Father Hudson's group, the Catholic Immigration Society in 1907. Lillian was 10 years old and sent to work as this domestic and later sent to Quebec where she worked in a paper mill. She lost the tip of her finger and the not so great working conditions. And Lily had no memory of her family. When she got married, she put for her parents' names because she had no recollection who her parents were. So she just put her mother's name was Mary and her father's name was John. Lillian tried to search for her name starting in the 1920s, but she did not receive her birth certificate in, in 1964 when she was applying for her old age pension. Lillian met her husband at their local church in Ottawa. They had six children together and she was widowed when her youngest child was two years old. In 1925, Lillian started on the journey to find her identity. Unfortunately, she was unable to find her birth name and her date of birth until the 1960s when she applied for her old age pension. Some organizations had great records with intake photos, but others did not keep their records or had inadequate records. Some agencies took intake pictures, some did not. Unfortunately for the organization that Lillian went through, they did not take pictures and they did not have adequate record keeping. I, it's 2023 and I've been trying since 1990 to get a copy of her file from the Catholic Immigration Society. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of red tape and there is some issues with finding her records. And Agnes was sent to three different orphanages, orphanages from 1899 to 1907. So every year and a half, or every couple of years, she moved around. And, that, and she was adopted in 1901 and was given a new name and then returned to another Catholic orphanage with that same name. So they didn't know what her actual birth name was. And then so she was renamed 
Mary Lillian Maitland for the purpose of immigration. Her husband's sister-in-law remembers her as speaking French and a very, very super nice person, but a very tidy woman. And she spoke of her very fondly. So this is what you would find for her or for anyone if you're looking for um, immigration record. So she came over from on the Virginian in 1907 from the port of Liverpool. She arrived in Quebec. So here's the story of the 398 British home children journey in 1902 from England via Liberty into Boston, USA, to Montreal, Quebec, to various destinations in Canada. So why would, quick question, why would, instead of going, why would the ships go to Boston? not to Canada directly. They had to go around because of the Boer War in 1901. The first Boer War, by the way. And one boy died on the ship and was buried at sea. And one boy died as a result of an accident when they were disembarking at the Boston Harbor. So Edward George Adley, a Southampton boy, was killed by falling into the hold of the New England. Boy was Edward George Adley, 11 years old. Southampton, England, when the holds were open to work the cargo yesterday, Adley unnoticed, left, unnoticedly left the group, wandered about and fell into the hold a distance of three, 30 feet, receiving a fracture of the base of the skull. This makes the second death since the party left Liverpool. The other was that of a boy named Henry Hartley, who died on the voyage and was buried at sea. So this is the Montreal train station. And this is a typical trunk that some ch children would have sent, sent with. Um, a lot of the organizations, well, mostly a lot of Bernardo's ones did send similar trunks. Um, some organizations only sent the children overseas with a duffel bag. So they would have church clothes, uh, night clothes, a Bible, um, you know, a blanket, and paper and pencil for letter writing. And that most likely was it, the bare necessities. So this is in um, Liverpool. This is the, one of their docks in about 1907. So here's an interesting US custom report from an, uh, Here's one question and answer. Do they examine the children when you arrive at St. John or Quebec? They count them. Do they check off the names? No. Interesting to think about. So this is, was the uh, third class birth. Um, they were probably getting quite a few children in there. And this was the third class dining lounge. They were just getting basic staples on, on the boats, whatever would keep for the voyage. And we have some memorials. 
So this is one memorial from in Peterborough, about from the Hazel Bray home. And there's our quilt again. It's a beautiful done quilt. I've seen it many times. And if you get the opportunity, please take a look. The home children and their descendants have helped to build Canada to the country it currently is, as they served their adopted country with some, some with the ultimate sacrifice. They were builders, farmers, teachers, and caregivers. Some never had the love of a caring family in their beginning years, and they strive to forget and to build a better life for themselves and their families. Thank you for letting me share the story of the home children. Please take the time to share what you've learned. And if you have any questions or stories to share, please contact us on Facebook, Home Children Canada. And we also have a research group on Facebook as well. We have so many people who love to share their stories and love to hear your stories or any questions or help you're willing to offer. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Shannon. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has questions at this moment, um, but I was wondering if you could share some of the resources or sites that you've used to help with your genealogical search um, for your descendants. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, I can forward that to my, uh, yeah, some of the research um, for my genealogy um, regarding my home, um, because uh, my nanny was through the Catholic Immigration Society. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have on, with the uh, home children, we do have a register index. And also, and that's also listed on our Facebook site. So, so did you start when you wanted to start this research? So if somebody is interested to see if they have somebody in there. Oh, people. okay. So yeah, if someone's just interested in uh, wanting to know about their um, family member, whether or not they actually were a home child. Mm -hmm. um, mine, I kind of came, my personal story was kind of, I don't know, different or not. Um, I had a great uncle give me a pile of papers when my nanny passed away in 1988. Um, he was the keeper of her papers. Um, he was actually the youngest child of that family. And uh, so she had copies, they had copies of her correspondence that she was looking for her family. So I went and um, I think who I contacted, unfortunately that person's passed away. Um, but um, I just Googled home children, British home children. And um, and I went, to, there was a workshop, um, uh, Laurie Chesky was doing it. So there is a registry. Um, you can actually, you know what, if you know your person's name, your family member's name, you can go onto our registry, type in their name and see if they're actually on that list. On some census records, um, they're listed as a, a border or domestic or servant. If that's, you know, if, sometimes that's what they listed them as on the census records. Um, depends on what time of year they were taken um, or if, and if they were still in a receiving home, they would have to uh, list them like in Canada. And even in England, they were supposed to have them listed on the census records. So they would have like, some of them, they said a list of inmates and it was like receiving home. Um, then they would have the list of all the children there. And even on uh, immigration records, um, I showed one with uh, the just Lillian's um, 
the name, but if you go on to the actual intake of the actual record of it, it was a party. Unfortunately, it was very hard to read. So that's why I didn't copy and paste it on the presentation. They were, there was like 40 children and they had someone, their dead mother or whatever, their person in charge. And it said right on it going to um, Montreal. St. George is receiving home. So what kind of records have you used? So you're mentioning like census records or um, I know- Census records, um, our registry index. Um, see a lot of these children, like here in Canada, once they became of age, a lot of them didn't want to talk about it. But doing your research, like you have to, it, it's very tedious to find. But I would highly recommend going to our registry index with the, with the home children one. And then just look at census records. That's, you know what, sadly, that's the key. Um, Because some of it wasn't even noted. Like, what does it say on their birth certificate? On my nanny's case, um, the the family record that she got, um, like for her birth certificate, is completely different from what the name she immigrated with. She was born Az Daisy Sullivan. She had parents. She never knew she had parents. When she came over, when she was 10, she was told she was Mary Lillian Maitland. And on her marriage certificate, she put John and Mary as her parents' names because she had no clue. None. She enlisted her parish priest to help her. And I have copies of her records and they pretty much just told her, this, this, is, what, hey, this is what we think we know and then uh, leave us alone. Stop writing to us. We know mm -hmm. nothing anymore. Yeah. That's not, you know, it, in my nanny's case, it happened. Um, some families, had, especially if you have the bigger organizations like Bernardo's, there was a lot more information forthcoming. Um, they have to send away for it. And, it, you know, they have a humongous backlog because especially of the pandemic. Um, but uh, it's, it's just a lot of, I know it's, there's no one answer, one thing to look for. Yeah, no, I'm, it was more of a, like from a genealogical perspective. Exactly. I know. Um, there's like, like, I just happened to find, I lucky I was finding those records and then I just went into census records. Um, they've opened up more records in here in Canada. They're more available now. They're more current. And then even for um, over in England, um, you're just gonna have to go with the known, mm -hmm. what you know and go back. And sometimes the known is not the truth. And that's the sad part. Right, yeah. And how do you um, obtain census records? So I know, but just so that it's in the recording, um, where would you find? So if you wanted to, the, to get the British census records or even from here in Canada, where would people go to look for those? Um, you can also look on Ancestry. Um, you can also, other those types of websites. Um, and there's also, I think Ancestry is the big one. Mm -hmm. um, or you can go to your, depends on your skill level um, to your, if they have the records anymore. I remember doing this when it was microfiche. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, those lovely reels and those microfiche. Um, so um, even going to your local library and uh, your special collections and um, asking the, um, the library in there and see what they can help you access with. Because I looked at, personally, I looked, I live in Hamilton, Ontario, and I looked at records for Ottawa and places around there um, through our special collections. So that's where I would recommend trying on Ancestry. I'm not promoting the website. I have no affiliation with it, <laughs> but, um, but it's one of the better ones. 
yeah as my dad keeps telling me <laughs> all right well that's great thank you um are there any questions from anybody else who's on the call right now um if not or if you don't have a question that you want to ask live you're welcome to send me an email um, and i can connect you with shannon um, or with the british home child network um, that we found shannon through so um so if anybody has questions after this please feel free to reach out um, and the recording for the the talk will be right on the township website all right Everybody's quiet. They're still having coffee this morning. I know it's early. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Work <Nothing>. obligations. <laughs> well, thank you so much for you know letting me uh, share the story, and um, hopefully we can get more people out to share these stories and um, get our voices heard. That's great. Thank you so much, Shannon, for your time this morning, and for everybody who was able to join in live. Um, and uh, we look forward to having more conversations about this in the future. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And everybody have a great day. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.